If your food media diet is fueled by HRN, become a monthly donor today. Visit heritageradionetwork.org slash donate. Welcome to Pizza Quest. I'm Peter Reinhardt, a man on a never-ending search for the perfect pizza. This show is the audio version of the Pizza Talk YouTube series, where I engage in interesting conversations with some of the country's greatest pizza makers and other artisans. Thanks for joining me on this quest. Hi, I'm Peter Reinhardt, and welcome to Pizza Talk. I'm very excited about today's episode. We've been talking about this one, planning it for a while, and we have the Pizza Yodis back, uh, Brian Spangler and John Arena, and we're adding to our Pizza Yodi panel today with Adam Kuban, who many of you know for years and years as uh, as uh, the voice of Slice New York, of Serious Eats, and uh, those of you who are lucky enough to live anywhere near him also know about his his pop-up uh, bar pizza, Margo's Pizza. Is it Margo's Pizza? Is that what you call Margo's Pizzeria or Margo's Pizza? Adam? Margo's Pizza. Margo's Pizza, which yeah. is... Uh, which is really his his tribute pizzas back to an era that this show today is all about, which is depending on where you grew up and what you called it, bar pizza, parlor pizza, uh, tavern pizza. Uh, everybody has their own reference points on this. So what we're going to do is talk for a few minutes with uh, all three of our Yodis today about this era because this style is coming back big time. And we think maybe a poss- great possibility it could be the next big trend now that Detroit style and Roman style have all had their moment in the sun. Uh, we're, we're, we're looping back around to a, to a time where uh, many of us have sort of a nostalgic connection. So, Brian, actually, you're the one who triggered this whole episode. So I'm going to let you sort of get the ball rolling on this because uh, you just are on fire with this style. I, it's, God, I'm in love with it. Uh, it's... Uh... So, being from Detroit, right? So, I used to go to Buddy's on the way to Detroit Tiger Games. And, um, you know, we just called it pan pie, right? You know, we didn't call it Detroit style pizza. Uh We just called it like pan pie. And there was, you know, like Detroit has a huge history of pizza. We had uh, Little Caesars was out of Michigan. We had uh, Domino's is out of Michigan, right? That's so, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Most people uh, like don't realize what a major influence the, the the Detroit area has been on the overall pizza world. Right. So you know, like you know, like going to like you know, when we we were going to like a, a Tiger game, it would be like we get stop by Buddy's and get a pan pie. We just call it pan pie. Um, but in 76, my father got a two year gig in San Jose and I was introduced to this parlor style, what I, I call parlor style, <clears throat> which I think is an influence from the bar style, tavern style of New Jersey and uh, Chicago. And um, I'm guess I'm guesstimating. I don't really. Yeah. yeah. I'd love to know more history about this. But so when I get to San Jose in '76, then it's like there's pipe organs and silent movies and <laughs> video games, and it's like it's just like it's fantasy land. But it's like this crackery crust, kind of bubbly. You know, it's like it's a, there's there's a lamination going on there. So, um, uh, so this notion of parlor, like a pizza parlor, which was a, a phrase we don't hear that often anymore, but that was a pretty common phrase back then. This kind right. of connects with this style. Well, the pizza parlor means like family. It's fa- means family to me. Uh-huh. Like pizza parlor means family. Um, so when you I hear bar style and I hear tavern style means bar, right? Parlor means family. I see. So, yeah. that, you know, for me, um, and I've been to uh, Star, and I've been to uh, Vito and Nick's, and I know Vito and Nick's 
started off as a tavern initially, and after Prohibition had ended, then they, you know, started introducing pizza to keep. Where, where was this Vito and Nick's? Vito and Nick's in Chicago. In Chicago, okay. So that, so there's that, there's the Chicago version of it, and then of course Adam and I, we had a conversation a few years ago when you were just getting Margos kind of going as a pop up. Uh, and you and my, this is where I sort of started hearing about the revival of this style uh, for the first time. Uh, and and it was, there was a place you cited in Jersey, wasn't it? That was sort of the reference point or your your sort of iconic version that triggered your your passion for it. Yes. So um, for bar style, um, I always blab about this. I'm very careful to call mine bar style or bar pizza. Because there's a place, um, there's a few places here out on the East Coast that uh, serve versions of this. Um, now, the South Shore of Massachusetts, it's a huge hotbed of bar pizza. And it's slightly different from the stuff I make, which is influenced by New Jersey style bar pie or bar pizza. Or um, my other big influence is the Colony Grill in Stamford, Connecticut. Star and, and Colony are very thin. Whereas uh, the South Shore bar pies, I think, are a little thicker. Um, the one thing that unites them all, though, is they're all cooked in a pan. They're all started, or at least they're started in a pan. All the ones here are on the East Coast. Started in a pan, once they set up, and the crust is firm enough to pull, to stand on its own, they're pulled from the pan and then flashed on the hearth of usually a deck oven. Uh, now, there are some places that do it completely in impinger ovens, but to me, flashing it on the deck uh, kind of gives it this, I wouldn't say intangible, because it's inherently tangible, because you can feel it, but it gives it this um, very uh, almost indescribable texture that I feel you missed doing it all in the pan. Interesting. Uh, so that's yeah, complexity to the whole experience. Yeah, the ones here might... Yeah. So, and so my two big influences were Star Tavern in New Jersey, Star in Orange, New Jersey, and, and Colony Grill, which started in Stamford, but is now uh, franchising has several locations. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, we'll probably see more of them now that the style is sort of like caught fire again. Yeah. John, you at, at Metro Pizza, you, you pay tribute to a lot of styles, the styles of many regions. Uh, are you doing any a pizza, anything like that already, or would you have plans to, to we, bring we, that on? We're definitely getting ready to. You know, it's, uh, you know, bar pizza, the phrase bar pizza or tavern pizza, it's just like every other phrase in, in the pizza in the pizza world. It's which tavern, which bar, whose grandma? You know, I mean, everybody's got their own interpretation, whether it's regional. I mean, it's not even, you can't even say it's regional. It's from block to block or, you know, from, could be on the same street to two vastly different methods and techniques. Yeah. But I think really, when we talk about tavern pizza or bar pizza, by nature, there's got to be simplicity. It's got to be. It's got to be a pretty easy process because it was started out in bars. You know, it wasn't the focal point. The focal point, the purpose of the pizza was to keep people, get people in there to buy drinks. Yeah. So you know, so we we want to keep that simple. And you know, Brian, of course, touched on something really important that parlor pizza. Using that phrase, I think, is more welcoming, more more family oriented. So I really got exposed to this style of pizza in two different ways. The first was even though my family owned a pizzeria, my very first pizza memory was a p was pizza in a bar when I was four years old. And I remember distinctly, and I can track the time because my aunt lived in an apartment above above a bar. <laughs> and we went to visit her, and my mom, my mom and my aunt and I and I went to have pizza. And she moved out of there when I was five, so I know I was four years old when this, when this took place. And we went into this bar, and I was you know it was dark and mysterious and smelled like beer, like old beer. <laughs> and and we got a pizza and I was and even, I mean that's my even though my family owned pizzerias that's yeah. my first pizza memory was that the smell of that pizza and biting into it and burning the roof of my mouth <laughs> right right yeah we all have that memory I think we all started smelled, you know, it smelled so though. good it was like I couldn't wait to take a bite and I grew, it just grabbed you know as a little kid I just grabbed it and bit into it and burned my mouth but <laughs> it didn't turn it didn't turn me off to it and you know, so I always made a distinction between pizzeria pizza and bar pizza or tavern pizza. Uh -huh. And then that same aunt shortly afterwards moved to Colorado. And when I was a kid, I went to visit her in Colorado and they had a Shakey's there. 
Yep. And Shakey's to me was like the definitive parlor pizza. Uh, well, let's talk about Shakey's for a second. And uh, 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 Brian had mentioned too that that was kind of a reference point for him. Adam, how about you? Is Shakey something that was a part of your experience uh, uh, as you were kind of getting into this style? Did you did you have a Shakey's anywhere where you were living? So I. <clears throat> I think it's kind of indirectly influenced me because a lot of what I'm doing um, is an amalgamation of different pizzas that I've had throughout the country. Uh, and also, um, my dad was a huge Shakey's fan. I've never personally had Shakey's, but from when I was very little on, he would try to recreate like, his big pizza at home. It was a very thin, cracked, crusted pizza. And I also grew up my Milwaukee. And they have a version of like thin crust. I would say it's probably very similar to Chicago thin crust, but it's a lot of the same ethos there, you know, like very thin, crackly, yeah. loaded yeah. with cheese and toppings. Like for sausage, it's nice big chunks of like of fennel y, garlicky sausage. Yeah. And yeah. so that, I, I inherited a love for that. I've never had actual shakies. But, um, but, but, but shaky like chase is like that in crust. If there was a time, and many of us who were watching this may not, if you're not, uh, you know, our age might not realize this, but there was a time when Shakey's was the big name on the block. I mean, Pizza Hut and Shakey's, and, you know, they were kind of like the dominant chains. And there were there were hundreds and hundreds of Shakey's. Now there's only a few. I'm not sure how many are left, if any. But I know that they, you know, were kind of in a reorg mode and we're trying to bring it back. And this might be the time because, as Brian pointed out, that really was sort of the, the the pizza parlor experience that turned this style of pizza into a family adventure. Yeah, it, it really kind of blew up from uh, Shakey's established in 54 in Sacramento, and then Round Table in 1956. And then you had, it was so popular that then it exploded into other factions like pizza and pipes. Then the, you brought in these like brass pipe organs. Yeah. You were projecting like, you know, our, our gang or little rascals on, you know, silent movies on a screen. And, yeah. <laughs> you know, and this is the seventies, uh, <clears throat> black and white video games, the early, early Atari video games, you know, and it's ski ball and all that stuff. It was, just, it was a family fun. It was like, you know, like, we couldn't wait till Friday. It was kind of like a precursor to Chuck E. Cheese, it sounds like. Exactly. Yes, of course. <laughs> well, well, before we run out of time on this segment, uh, you know, I want to talk a little bit about each of your takes on, like, you know, how you approach then making this pizza as you're bringing this into your own methodology and, and drawing together from various memories. Uh, how are you recreating the experience uh, in your versions? So well, let me start with Adam, because, because Adam was the first one that really kind of brought this to my attention a few years ago. And so, Adam, what is it about this, and, 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 and what's your method for how to do it? Because you're going to, later on, you're going to actually take us through, uh, how, you know, the making of one of yours. Well, mine, like I was saying, I'm kind of chasing, I'm going to feel like it's an amalgamation of many different styles or, like, bits of styles I've loved that I've had throughout the country. Uh, so... From my dad, I inherited this love of like the crackery, super thin pizza loaded with cheese and the nice chunky sausage. Uh, from New York style, though, what I love is that it's crisp and you can fold it. It's not like 100% crackery where it shatters all over. Um, right. I was especially cognizant of that when I was trying to develop this recipe for the New York market because you know, like New Yorkers don't always take to things that they're not familiar with. So I want to give them a little bit of that familiarity. Um, from Detroit style, I love that Frico edge. And uh, a lot of the bar, a lot of the bar pizza I've seen around the Northeast, as some of it has a little bit of Frico edge, some of it doesn't, uh, but I wanted to have it 100% around. I will point to Star Tavern because if anybody wants to Google this, they have, have a very unique pan. They take, um, right. They take the steel pans or aluminum pans. This is a nesting deep dish pan. This uh -huh. is a twelve by twelve by I think two. 
but what they do is they cut out most of the edge except for maybe an eight inch or so portion here and they use that as a handle and they start baking it in the pan they roll it out rolling it up build and then put it in the oven in the pan and whatever is around the edge that they've left gets that Frico edge. Everything yeah. else just kind of right. slides out a little bit. When it's you know set enough that yeah. it'll slip off the, they go in like a magician, and a table you know, like ripping the tablecloth off, and they pull it back and let that pie sit on the hearth for a while. Wow. Now I'd always love going to Star and you know fighting with people over who gets that little bit of edge, like the one or two or one slice and partial slice that gets that edge. So for mine, I do not cut away the rim, and I just carefully fish it out with a fish turner. Uh -huh, uh, uh -huh. I really wanted that to destroy the edge. So that's I've kind heard, of the I've amalgamation. Heard, of heard, okay, uh, Brian. Okay. Yeah, I've heard that some of the old pans were actually cut differently, <laughs> so that you could actually like grab the pan so the pizza would slice. Like it was like almost like a moon, like a half moon shaped pan. Huh. So oh, the, yeah, I the, the, yeah. The, the bottom, but there was no edge on one half of it, so you could like slip it out. Oh yeah, that's that's exactly what I'm talking about. They okay. just maybe I wasn't super clear. They cut out, they cut away everything else, but like a little eight inch section of this rim. Yep. yep. So that's their yeah, and yep. then they pull it away like a magician pulling a tablecloth. <laughs> right. Wow. Okay. All right, so yeah. so the, uh, uh, breaking, I'm sorry, you were breaking up a little bit there. Yeah, uh, we're having a little a little bit oh, of the Zoom, the Zoom issue. We'll see if we can resolve that during the, the break between this segment and the next. But uh, before we break again, John, uh, what's your take on and how are you going to execute? And you'll show us this, of course, in your segment. But uh, what's what's your sort of perspective on how to make the classic bar style pizza? Like like Adam, my my take on it is going to be a hybrid. The combination of ideas, discussion that I had with Brian over, over time about what this, what the texture is supposed to be, an observation. There's a there's a place in in New York called Eddie's. Adam, I don't know if you've ever been there. It's in New Hyde Park. That does it. That does a. a yeah, pie. Eddie's is. It's a it's a bar. It's a very thin bar pie, and and I've I've been in his kitchen and, ta and talked to the pizza makers, and what they do is they roll the dough out. And then they put it in a very low temperature oven for like 20 minutes and dry it out. Ah. And then they stack those up and they use them during the course of the day. Probably That's interesting. Several days. That's so it's interesting. It's not really a hard bake. It's like a, I mean, it's like not even really a bake because it's so low temperature. It's right. almost like just putting a skin on the dough. It's yeah. like dehydrating. Right. And, and, and I think Brian kind of, uh, we, when you, we get into yours, and Brian's going to go first, he's going to show us you know, his method uh, uh, first when we come back. Um, but you've noticed the same thing, the idea of a little bit of drying out of the dough and making it ahead so that something happens to the, you know, when you get the skin, <clears throat> pardon me, on the dough. Uh, so, uh, and we'll talk about, with, when we do each of your statements, we'll talk a little bit more about the dough itself, the formula that you've chosen, whether you've modified or an existing dough or doing a, a totally unique dough for this. But Brian, uh, why don't you just for for just a minute or two just tell us quickly about you know your observation as you've been uh, really on a kind of a uh, an immersion into trying to perfect this style uh, almost I would say uh, an obsession with this style for the last uh, you know couple of months. Uh, what, well, what, what are actually, some of your main takeaways? It, it heralds back to that '77 moment in San Jose when my. You know, it's like it's like me it's memories. It's uh, uh, not to I'm not going to go too too deep down that road, but yeah, it's like you know, it's like my childhood, and uh, it's something lost right now. It's a, it's a it's a, it's a beautiful style, but mine's a little different from what Adam is you know is going for and what uh, maybe other people have experienced. I was going for that, you know, like, you know, in 1977, I was going to Shakey's and Round Table and Pizza and Pipes. It was different. It was laminated. So, you know, the, the things that I've had in, in Chicago and uh, 
in Jersey are very, like, very flat and crispy, which is great. I love it. But I think someone found a – here's my theory. It's a theory. Is that they were using the scraps because they were sheeting everything out in long sheets and cutting them out in cookie cutters. Uh, what are you going to do with all this other dough, right? You start folding it back in on itself and you're going to throw it away. Uh-huh. They started rolling it back through and going, wow, this is even better. It started giving these like bubbles. Uh-huh. We call bubs. Um, <laughs> and there was that, it's a, it's a, it's a pita. Uh-huh. You know, it starts air, to separate. Air, yeah. Air air separate. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, textually it's really important. Um, yeah, it totally changes everything because it gives you that flakiness that, that you were describing. Well, All right, well, this you know, when you have, when you have air, like you know, it's like a, okay, cut a big thick slice of um, prosciutto versus a thin paper sheet, thin of prosciutto, right, right, big yep. difference, right. So. In other words, air is the critical ingredient in the flavor experience. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Well, let's take let's 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 stop here for a second because I want to I want to like give us a chance to reload. Brian, you've got to get into your your kitchen. You're gonna you're gonna go ahead and show us and exactly what you were just describing, uh, sort of how you took these ideas of turning the scraps and how what that did to the dough into an actual methodology that may be the method if you can keep up with the demand because it sounds like a little extra work involved on how to make this style of pizza and a pizza shells. I'm gonna charge more. You charge more. That's how you make it work. Yeah, I hear you. Need more work. You'll you'll see. Like okay, excellent. We well, we're gonna we're gonna take a break here, folks. We want you to come back for part two. Uh, and by the way, this is gonna be a like a an all week uh, exploration of bar style and parlor style pizza. So we're gonna be uh, doing a, a, a segment with all three of our Yodis today, showing us their methodology. We'll be back with Brian Spangler from a Pizza Show, showing us how he's. Uh, how he's sort of uh, synthesized all of these memories, techniques, and all the things he's learned by being in the pizza business into what will soon be the newest met the newest menu item at a pizza shoals. Yep. It's bar pizza. We'll see you back in the next segment. Stick around for more Pizza Quest after a word from our sponsor. Hey, this is Hannah, HRN's program manager. You may have noticed that we have a whole new look. We also launched a new website that's going to make your listening easier and more enjoyable than ever before. HRN is the original food podcast network. And as we enter a new chapter in our 12 year history, I want to ask you to invest in HRN for the long haul. If you rely on this show to fuel your food media diet, become a monthly sustaining member today. Our members keep the voice of America's food movement alive and kicking. Your donations support this podcast along with 40 other shows on Heritage Radio Network. Your contribution helps give HRN the security we need to stay on the airwaves throughout the pandemic, and your continued support is allowing us to reopen our studio. Plus, we like to give our regular members special treatment. So sign up to become a monthly donor and get access to our secret menu. We've gathered together exclusive discounts and offers from some of your favorite food and beverage brands. So you get to enjoy insider pricing on goods that will ship right to your door. Join our community of monthly donors and special deals will come your way throughout the summer. So can you make a gift of five or $10 a month? It'll show me and our whole team at HRN how much this podcast and food radio in general means to you. Become a monthly sustaining member today at heritageradionetwork.org slash donate. Welcome back to Pizza Talk, and uh, this week is dedicated to bar, parlor, tavern-style pizza, you name it. Uh, it's all, you know, different uh, variations of a theme, and we're going to start with uh, Brian Spangler at our Pizza Shows, and, of course, his trusty sidekick, Andres, 
who is going to be uh, both helping and also uh, you'll be the cameraman today for this first segment, right? Uh, yeah. So you'll be, you'll be, uh, uh, you got a new camera. We're going to try to get really in on this and see it up close. Brian is going to take us through his method, the thing that the technique he's kind of come up with through this obsessive quest for the perfect version of a, a parlor pizza. And so, uh, Brian, take it away and show us how you did it. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to laminate the dough. <clears throat> so when you say laminate, basically we think of things like croissants and danishes. Is that similar technique? Yeah. So uh, we're going to run the dough. The, this dough has been fermented in bulk for like two hours um, yesterday and then refrigerated overnight. So, so I've got to ask you this because uh, it's the first question that comes to my mind. Is it, is it the same dough that you use at Shoals for your regular pizza, or is it a different dough? So this is 48% hydration, like very minimal. I see. Thing. So much denser, stiffer dough. Yeah. Yeah. With, um, you know, it's got uh, dried milk powder uh, mm. and uh, lard in, in here. And lard is, of course, one of the secret ingredients. And, and why did you choose lard instead of, say, shortening or even oil? Well, they don't make shortening anymore, really. <laughs> Not the way we grew up with it. Yeah, they. No, no. Like, it's, yeah. Yeah, there's, there's, that, that's all dead. So, so lard is really like the original shortening. Right, right. So it gives you that nice, like, you know, like think of um, making the perfect pie crust, right? Yeah. So this is very short mix. This is six minutes in a in a mixer. With you know the last few minutes going into uh, it's a, you know the last few minutes is the shortening going in. I see. Uh, the first two minutes is everything but salt. After two minutes, salt, and then after two minutes thereafter, the lard, and then. Two minutes thereafter, we should just shut it down. So basically, you're holding back the salt and the lard in order to promote uh, hydration of the dough, and then you put the salt in to tighten the dough, and then you put the, the lard in because that if you put that in too early, it'll it'll get in the way of gluten development. So you're Correct. So, so you're phasing, you're uh, staging it in order to be able to have a short mix but get maximum uh, functionality. Correct. Yeah, you know, because you want to have the. Uh, you want to you, you want to hydrate the, the all the, the the flour, right? You get all the enzymatic activity and all the the packages activated. <laughs> then we add salt, and then after yeah, you know, after two minutes we we add the salt, and then after you know, two minutes thereafter we add the, the lard at the very end. And so it's a it's a very short mix. It's like it's really rough, choppy. If you can. Uh -huh. See, like this has been two hour ferment at bulk at room temperature and then overnight. So it's look at this. Yeah. It's, it's, it's very job. It's it's like a biscuit. It's kind of a biscuity. It looks like a biscuit though, yeah. But then of course you're gonna start to fold it so it'll get even it'll develop a little bit more. Well now, you know, thanks to my good boy on the this here. We're gonna, we're gonna pat it down. Start running it through the sheeter. So for f at a lot of places where they obviously are not going to have a sheeter, like many bars are not going to have a sheeter, they would probably use a, ro a rolling pin, right? <laughs> so that's the first round, right? Yeah. Then you keep adding flour on top of it. That's got plenty of flour. I don't need any more on that side. Go through another pass. All right. Now the These lamination kind of like holding it in on itself. Yeah. So that flour in between, in a way, kind of helps to promote that separation later on, I would think. Right. Okay. So first lamination, you've got a threefold. You're going to run it through again, force those layers together, but with the addition of that flour to kind of make it so that it does want to separate. Yeah, so just keep running through this. It's actually like a, it's a, a 
it's actually a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> I know this is why, uh, you know, uh, the next phase of this for you is going to be to figure out how to make it work in a high production operation. I get myself into. Yeah, exactly. Um, exactly. <laughs> but it's, it's like, it's worth, it's worth, it's worth the work. It's, yeah. when you have the final product, um, it, it's, it's really, it's fantastic. You'll see the, the end result. Well, that's what we're, that's what we're really looking forward to seeing how it all sure. pays off in the end. So, so how many more of these passes do you go through? Kind of run through again. Okay. Yeah. Then we're going to. Another fold. Yeah. Right. Up again. Right. Okay. Yep. Andres is much better at this than I am because he used to work on a tortilleria. Ah. In the Yucatan, right? Yeah. Okay. He's like, he, look, he looks at me and he's like, what are you doing? <laughs> and why is it taking you so long? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> Flojo. ¿Qué pasa, Flojo? <laughs> so, so that's going to be one of the secrets of getting this into your onto your menu is you have to have somebody like Andres who can really crank them out. No, yeah, exactly. It's it's, it's the the scalability, the production. Uh, yeah. Of all those stuff. And of course, like I, I'm not, I'm not using like, like you know, like the, the massive industrial unit. Well, when you start to, uh, you know, start to crank out 400 of these a day, you may have to upgrade. So now it's getting thinner, so we're gonna go to level eight. Get a little thinner. So you're taking it down to a, a pretty thin level. How much yeast is there in this? Is less than usual, or the same as, as in most doses? A little more, because it's it's uh, forty eight percent hydration. So so you put more yeast in. Yeah. Is that what you said, John? Yeah, because forty eight percent is a pretty pretty stiff, dense dough compared to most yep. pizza doughs would be between sixty and sixty six or sixty eight percent hydration. All right. So you know, now we're seeing how it's more flour. <laughs> Watch this. Wow, you're passing it through again without a fold now. You're just stretching it out now. <laughs> wow, and it keeps on coming. So how, how thin would you say it is now? About an eighth of an inch? Uh, eighth of an inch? Yeah, okay. Maybe. And what uh, I don't have, I didn't bring it up here. I, I took a piece of PVC or ABS uh -huh. that I rolled this up on and then rolled back through like a tube. I see. You kind of roll it, wrap you, it around you, it. Yeah. I, can, I can do it without it, but. Yeah. Well, that's how they do it in high productions is they have these, these uh, rollers, the dough rolls up on it. Like, and they kind of books out on the roller and then they can unspool it. There we go. There we go. Wow. So, so even another pass, you're really getting it thin. So now we have, look, you know, huge sheet of dough. Wow. So, so as you how many pizzas, you can break, make a number. It looks like you can make about 10 pizzas from that. Uh, six. Six? Well, I guess it depends on the size. Six, 12 inch. Yeah. 12, 12 inch, okay. This is uh, not quite the thickness I wanted to be. So, do one more pass. Wow. There you go. Look at that. Fantastic. It's almost uh, thin enough to be able to see through. It's like strudel dough. Yeah. So, yeah, about eighth of an inch thick. Even less, it looks like. Yeah. So, I'm going to try your finish this up later on a flour real well. Yeah. We'll well, you know, because I don't want to waste this stuff because I got dough ready to go. Oh, okay. But you would, what would you do? Cut them out with a template into circles? Yeah. Hold on. Where's, uh, so, so, but basically what he's done is he's rolled out almost like rolling out a, a, a phyllo or a strudel dough, super thin, uh, but of course yeasted and, and now with the folds, some layers going on. And then, and then he's, he's looking for his, uh, his cutter. There we go. And he's going to cut circles. Right? Yeah. American Metal Brush makes these things where you just like put it down and cut these pieces out. Like Got it. All right. 
and then and then you would stack them because they're dry enough you could actually stack them without them sticking to each other. Yeah, you have to put some flour and some salamina in between. Mm -hmm. but, but, the, the but that's part of the process is to let them sit for a while. Yeah. Okay, and then okay, take us to the next phase then because we're going to run out of time. We're going to stack this up. Yep. This is the this is this stove's going to get folded and put away and be, and be cut gonna, later we're, because we're, you've already you've we're, already we're, prepped we're, some for us. Because if I if I let this sit too long, it's going to get it's going to be wasted. Yeah, it'll be a, it'll be dried out. And after yeah. all that work, you don't want to waste any. You want to turn them all into pieces. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So let's. I'm going to take this, and we'll run this through the uh, sheeter again later. It'll be better. The better, you know, the scraps. I think I think the scraps. Is what um, determined the whole lamination process for like shakies and what have yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. I think you mentioned that earlier that by throwing that those scraps in there, it, it added to the flakiness, the flaky yeah. of shaky. Yep. They realized that, uh, and, and and brown table actually became part of their process where they were like, okay, so. Or laminating yesterday's scraps into today's dough. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So it was so like the old with the new. Yeah. Again, it just gets better and better. Right. So I'm gonna put this away real quick. And now we're gonna make a pizza. All right. It's in that other one that that's more. Over there. Thank. You. Thank God I have an oven here. <laughs> it reminds me of what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah. So here we have a skin that was cut out. All right. It's been sitting in the refrigerator for two days after. So we laminated, let it uh, shoot out and uh, cut it. Will that will that be part of your method, Brian? Is to actually let it sit for two days before you use it? It, it seems to be like you know I'm I'm still learning. Like this is my fifth rodeo. So, uh, <laughs> you know, I've been, I've been researching this for years, but you know, I haven't only, I've only been doing it for five weeks. So. Right. And it, it's so amazing to, you know, to see, you know, the, the difference between this style and what you typically make your, your normal style, which is more of a uh, sort of new New York, New Haven style pizza, the nice and puffy around the edges and everything else. And uh, you, I mean, this, is, this is a whole different ballgame. Yeah, it's completely different. It's, but I love it. It reminds me of my childhood. It's fucking yeah. rad. So that's, uh, what's that, some uh, thick tomato sauce? Yeah, that's uh, super dolce from um, from Santa sauce. Uh -huh. But it's so thick that I have to use like this offset. Yeah, it's almost like a paste. Yeah, exactly. So this has got like 11 different ingredients in it. So I'm using super dolce with a lot of herbs and seasonings. But we want to get this all the way to the edge evenly. So I have to use this offset kind of like spatula. Like yeah. Almost like a cake. It really, it's like you're bringing, you're bringing a lot of other disciplines into the, into the making of this that, that um, many pizzerias or pizza makers would, wouldn't necessarily even have in their skill set. Right. Yeah, it's weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Well, this is what happens when somebody gets obsessed with an idea, and it brings it brings out all sorts of other but skills. But when it comes when it comes together, it's it's so rad. And we've got Adam and and uh, John watching on and and uh, prepping to and get ready to do theirs. But uh, if you guys want to chime in at any point, did either of you go through this same kind of like you know like? Uh, when you were first starting to make you, this this style of pizza for your, before you launched it, the same kind of like uh, um, I, I, keep, I don't want to keep using the word obsession, but uh, attention to detail and and experimentation and and you know kind of high focus. I think we probably all went through the same kind of processes, but I took the shortcut and just waited for Brian to do it, and then he told me what. He <laughs> and I worked on that. That's, that, that, that's the big secret. <laughs> we call that the original idea in 40 years. That's why we have uh, mentors that we call Yodas or Yodis that, uh, you know, kind of paved the way. 
How about you, Adam? I mean, you've been thinking about this style for uh, many years. Uh, did you have to kind of go through a process of fine tuning and throwing ideas out and trying different things? Yeah, I did a, a lot of work with pans. Um, I basically started chasing the style back in, I'd say, 2014. Um, wow, yeah. Starting yeah. at home, I wanted to, I knew I wanted to do a pop up pizza, pizzeria type thing. I was inspired by this guy, uh, Casey Crines, out in San Francisco. Uh, it's San oh, Francisco. No, that, not that guy. Yeah. <laughs> you, there you so, guys uh, know. <laughs> I love yeah, so. I was inspired by Casey's pop up. He started in the back pizza of a bar. Hack. Up. And I think I want to do something like Casey did. And originally I was thinking like, oh, I'll do some kind of New York, neo, like neo New York type style. But then I was like, wait, I really love what Colony Grill is doing and these thin, crispy bar type pizzas. Yeah. Why don't I yeah. do that? So I started chasing that. Um, and like I said earlier, I wanted to get like a Detroit Frico Edge. Yeah. Uh, so I started playing with all the different pans and eventually hit upon this pan to cook it in. That's interesting. Uh, so we're gonna yeah. we're gonna see that in action in the next segment. But yeah. notice that Brian is not using a pan for his. He's yeah. going right onto the onto the hearth or into the oven oh, yeah. for the peel. So you've got a ton of cheese on there. You really loaded it with cheese. What is it? Is it all mozzarella or is it a blend or what? No, it's a blend. It's uh, it's got aged uh, provolone and uh, Tillamook white cheddar. Yeah, Tillamook. So of course you're in Oregon, so you've got Tillamook cheese, cheddar, which I you know love, and uh, uh, I'm sorry. What I call the KAS, it's a King Arthur special. So uh -huh. A little white onion on top of this. Diced white onion, a little dice, bell pepper, pepperoni, obviously. And then I'm going to put some California black olives. <laughs> when you call it a King Arthur special, why did you get King Arthur? Is it a shout out to the flower company or to? A style like a round table style. Round table. A uh, round table. Okay. Got that and uh, with a, a mushroom. So this is like an everything pizza. Kind of. Dude, it's, it's it's so classic for this style of pizza. Yeah, yeah, and it's loaded, man. Like that, but that that dry dough can stand up to it. Oh yeah. No, it's it's glorious. And then I'm gonna hit it with some chili flake and some aged. Uh, <laughs> cheese on top of it how long does it take to bake six minutes so while it's baking i'm wondering if we could um uh sh switch over to adam uh, if he's ready to get give him a head start to get his process going and then we'll cut back to you uh when the pizza is ready to come out unless you want to unless you have some things in between that you want us to know about no no I'm... would that work for you adam to we just start right away with you uh uh, and then at some point we'll, we'll we're going to stop this segment. We're going to take a break and we're going to continue. I say we're going to do a segment three and a segment four. Usually we just do two on? segments. We're going to do four. That looks like it's ready to go in the oven, huh? Oh yeah, she's ready to go. Get it slide. All right, why don't you go ahead and slide it in? And uh, I'll tell you what we'll do. Let's take a break. Let's so come back. Computer? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. What was that? <laughs> I was making a joke. Oh, okay. Brian, put this pizza in. At what temperature, Brian? About 600? Uh, 550. 550. All right. We're going to take a break right here. We're going to come back with a whole new segment, and we're going to we're going to jump on Adams. And then, but we're, when you when your pizza's ready to come out, or maybe when we come back, we'll, we'll look. It should be uh, coming back out of the oven when we come back for the next segment. We'll, we'll we'll look at the pizza first, then we'll jump into Adams' method, and then we'll we'll wrap it up with John's in segment four. Uh, so we'll see three different takes on a similar style of pizza. All right, so join us on the next segment. And uh, Adam, you'll be up next, but we'll look at the finished version. So the ultimate tease, you don't get to see the pizza until you come back for the next segment. See you then. We'll be right back with more Pizza Quest, right after this break. Welcome back to Pizza Talk, and we've been promising you the reveal of Brian Spangler's bar pizza or parlor style pizza out of his uh, pizza shoals. Uh, and so Brian, Brian uh, that wasn't the pizza, that was just a good leg shot. Let's see a, uh, let, let, let's see the pizza. We've been dying to look at this thing. It was loaded with cheese and all sorts of everything toppings. Uh, what's the pizza itself look like now that it's out of the oven? Okay, Andres is in charge of the camera. 
There oh, it is. No. Let, me, let me see if I can get this here. You've got an awful lot of puff and pop for something that was so thin. Yep. That's all that lamination process. Exactly. Well, can you can you cut a slice out of it so we can see what it looks like, uh, both under under crust and maybe uh, you know how much how if any of that lamination shows up in the sides. Sure. Uh, let, let, yeah, I, you know what? While I go cut this up, I'm gonna have you do a little interview with Andres, my main man, while I come back in like five seconds. Okay, Andres. Yes. Thank you for doing the camera work today. We know how much work you're doing doing behind the scenes. Brian uh, leans on you as his right-hand man. Uh, and I know that you've had, uh, this style came to you pretty easy because you've done a lot of work with tortillas, right? Yeah, I used to work making pita bread and everything. Pita bread and, uh, uh, yeah, so, so, so rolling thin and, uh, you know, working with, uh, with thin doughs like this kind of comes second nature, huh? Yeah, it's pretty easy for me because I got all the ideas and everything. Well, based on how we saw uh, how much work it, it Brian put into making this dough, I, I don't see that any way it's going to make it onto the menu at a piece of Schultz unless you're the one who's making it because you can do it like three or four times faster than he can. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so we're about ready to see a slice of, uh, of the piece that Brian said he'd be right back with that slice. And in a second, we're going to go to Adam Kuban uh, out in New York who's going to make us in your kitchen the, the, the Margo's pizza version of the bar pizza, or the, do you, you prefer to call it bar pizza or bar style pizza, Adam? Either way, I call it bar pizza. Bar pizza, but it keeps it nice and short and easy to say. Uh, and then, of course, in the next segment, we'll see John Arena's version, uh, how he's kind of taken, again, some of the work that Brian has been doing, uh, the work that Adam has done, uh, his own childhood memories. Uh, we all kind of start and work from that and then try to not only recreate them, but take them to another level, reinvent them, so to speak. So uh, is he almost ready, Andres? Yeah, he's here. There he is. Here it comes. All right. So look at that. Right on the edge, right in that cornicion, we've got uh, a, an incredible separation and, and air gap, uh, some space. And, uh, can you get even closer to the camera? You're right, but without losing focus, we – all right, so we can see right. how thin – how thin the, the crust is, and, and we're not yeah, seeing the lamination the, works. Yeah, you can see a little bit of the separation there. So, yeah. how does that translate in when you take a bite out of it? Do you get the snap? The bottom. beautiful caramelization on the bottom. Ah, cheese crispy. Yeah. So, so of course, it's all about the combination of flavor, texture, mouth feel, and a big part of this experience, I think, and what's been driving your obsession with this style is that that snap and and crackly quality, uh, the shatter quality, so to speak, that, yeah, that's brought about by lamination. You can sit out for hours on a table and it's, you know, it's good to go. And it reheats really well. Like, I mean, Andres is now showing you, like, that other cut section right here. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. You can see, like, you know, all these bubbles, like, over here. Well, I can see why you've been so excited about doing this style. There's so much going on. There's so much drama in that pizza. And, uh, and so we're really uh, so grateful for the fact that you've you know, committed so much time and energy uh, to this. I know that if, uh, if it were not for the pandemic, who would have had time to uh, indulge yet another, another obsession? But uh, you were able to, to do this, and hopefully it will show up on the menu once you figure out how to be able to make it uh, you know, and crank them out because once you start offering them, it's going to... I hate to say it, but I don't really hate to say it, but this is my favorite salad pizza on the face of the planet. There you go. And Adam, it's been feeling <laughs> a lot along the same line. So we're going to cut over to Adam now because he's going to show us his method. And again, we you were telling us earlier too that you were saying that right now, be, uh, because of the pandemic, you're not really even doing the pop-ups. Uh, <laughs> I love Dude. it. Brian, Brian is showing us the, 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 the puff that he got in the air, the separation and the air gap. Right there in the edge. So you, got, that, so you got that Frico that Adam was talking about, that little Frico cheese crisp right around the edges. But, it's, but now we're going to see how Adam. We're going to see now how Adam gets there in a different way, using a pan to uh, achieve some of the same, uh, you know, effect. And Adam, you were saying that also that this this pizza can be reheated, and that if if you are going to be able to do it as a as a pickup and take it home thing, you'd have to include instructions to tell people how to bring it back to life and restore that snap. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I usually I usually just throw it right in like a 300 degree oven. It's a very wow. that noise. <laughs> it's uh, okay. Got racers racing up and down the highway behind our. Uh, hey, we're on. We're this is this is Zoom world, so we just go with the flow. Uh, yeah, I just throw it in like a 300, 325 degree oven directly on the rack for you know, about five minutes or so. Chris, so it's kind of like, yeah, kind of like what you would do with the any pizza you take home from a uh, pizzeria, but you have to bring back the snap. So how do you get it? So how do I get what? How do you get the pizza? How do you get to that Frico? And, you know, if you can take right. us through the steps, yeah. Yeah, let's, uh, let's go. You have to tilt my uh, camera down here. Okay, there we go. I don't know if you can see that very well. Oh, so so with this, I just roll out with a rolling pin. Now I know um, somebody mentioned, I think it was you, uh, Peter, you said, you know, a lot of bars might not have sheeters, uh, so they do rolling pins. I would say, like, the places I've been to that do, like, a thin crust style like this, uh -huh. um, Star does use rolling pins. They have, like, an army of older women. I, it's always been romanticized. Maybe they're, like, big grandmothers or ants or whatever, they're out there rolling out their pizza with um, rolling pins. Then they hand it over to the, the guys who build the pies onto the uh, onto the pans. Yeah. But a lot of the places I've seen use sheeters. And yeah. I know we talked about like the difference between parlors and bars and bars being unwelcoming to families. But a lot of the bar places here on the East Coast I've gone to that would be making bar style pizza have basically morphed into pizzerias. I mean, nobody's really going there to drink or to get hammered and watch a game, although there's a little bit of that going on. Um, a lot of them are there primarily for the pizza at this point. Interesting how that flipped. Those places are huge. Like, so they have enough room in their kitchen. I mean, they've, they've essentially turned into restaurants, so they've got sheeters. Um, so, and one thing I've always told myself is if I ever did this commercially, I would definitely get a sheeter. Yeah, you'd have to because you wouldn't be able to keep up with them with the demand. No, it takes like for the pop up, I do about 40, 40 of these, and it takes you know a good hour and a half, maybe hour, hour and a half to um, yeah roll out. Yeah, and even if you worked ahead of time, then then you're just spending so much of your day just rolling out the dough. Well, yeah, it takes like an hour or so, hour and a half to roll out forty. And I, I put them into these nesting deep dish pans. Uh -huh. um, and the nice thing about those is that there's a little tiny bit of clearance in these. These are Lloyd nesting deep dish pans. Are they Lloyd? Uh, yeah. SDK. And, uh, and Lloyd pans are pans that pretty much any home home cook can get now. Yeah. Yeah. Now that's pretty much why I got them. And they're, these are pre-seasoned, so I didn't have to worry about seasoning them. I've got like 40 of these that I use for the pop-up. Nice. Um, but the nice thing is that this dough is so thin that once I get them panned up, there's enough clearance in there that I can just stack them with the dough in there. And then I throw them in the low uh, boy yeah. to keep them for, to retard the rise. But if you keep them out on the counter, they'll rise up a little bit, and you'll get a, some nice bubbles in there. So here I'm not rolling it out to quite the diameter of the bottom of the pan. Uh -huh. That's probably about 11 inches or so. This pan is a 12 inch pan. Oh, I see, so you leave a little space, yeah. So I do leave a little space to um, to get it to the edge. Let's and see. you and like you said, you don't need to oil that pan because it's, it's glazed and you don't really even want I the oil. I don't need to oil it, but I'm going to put a little bit of vegetable shortening around the rim. Ah. And that's a couple things here. As you see, as I'm stretching, you see it's starting to snap back. Yeah. So I use the vegetable shortening, just like a chickpea size or so. Uh-huh. Just enough to kind of grease it, yeah. Just around the edge. And this does two things. Right now, it's going to act as a paste. It's going to paste that dough on there and oh, prevent that, it yeah. from snapping yeah. back. Yeah. And then I just, whatever a little bit I have, I'll just rub it around the middle. Now, I, didn't, I didn't ask you this, but uh, what was the, what's the hydration level of your dough? It's, it looks pretty stiff like Brian's. So mine is, uh, I call it a 62% effective. I don't know uh -huh. if that makes any sense. 
but it's, um, let's see, 8% oil and whatever 62 minus 8 is, 54, 54. 54 water. Oh, I see, so you can't water in the oil, the, yeah. The oil, you know, handle, once you get the oil in there, it handles uh -huh. effectively like water in there. Yeah, so it sounds like you're similar to what Brian's doing. What kind of flour do you use? Uh, this right here is um, just AP, and I'm just using Hecker's oh. now because what I could get during the pandemic was Hecker's flour. So that's a all-purpose flour, not high-gluten flour. Right. And how about you, Brian? What kind of flour did you use for yours? I used Keith Best from Central Milling. From Central Milling, but which is a, uh, that's a bread flour, right? Yeah, it's 50% <coughs> it's spring wheat, 50% winter wheat um, with a little ascorbic acid. Okay. So, um, yeah, yeah. So I would say that it probably rounds out to be twelve and a half percent protein. Maybe you know twelve. Okay. You know, between twelve and thirteen percent protein. Okay. All right. Let, let's go back to Adam now. So you just use the docker to to uh, to dock uh, the dough, so that I guess so that it wouldn't bubble up too much. Yep. Yeah. The big thing you have with this style when you cook it in a pan, especially if you're cooking um, a cheese, a plain cheese pie like I'm about to, is that it has a tendency to bubble up and sometimes it bubbles up in one big mound. And then of course you're not getting any contact with the pan. Right. So it's not cooking the dough. And that's, that's going to be an issue with this thing. So instead of, get, instead of getting it, bliss, blisters, you get a goiter. <laughs> yeah. And not yeah. even that, it doesn't cook. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So... Oh, yeah, here. So that's a, that's a really cool technique that you got, got the dough to adhere and not shrink back by using that 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 shortening to kind of hold it into place. I yeah. love that technique. Yeah. And so what that does too then is uh, later on it's going to act as a release once it melts because what I'm going to do here is uh, you'll see uh, ah. I'm going to cheese the edges eventually. And, and your sauce is a, a much thinner sauce than Brian's sauce, which was almost like paste. Um, yeah. And you've got it contained in a pan. So that makes, you know, so that gives you a little bit more flexibility for that. Yeah, so this sauce is basically just Sclafani crushed tomatoes. And it's just straight out of the can with some uh, seasonings added. Uh -huh. uh, well, this is here. Usually for the pop-up, I make a more involved sauce that's... Um, actually like a shakies inspired sauce. It has a has some green pepper in the sauce, some uh, shallots, and a lot of seasonings. And I actually found the base version of this on uh, pizzamaking.com. Yeah. yeah. Now you said that was about a 12 inch diameter pan, right? <clears throat> yes, the 12 inch diameter pan. And, and how much did the dough ball weigh? The dough ball here is 180 grams. Okay. Oh. So. Fairly thin. Um, yeah, and then I sauce it. Uh, at the pop-up, I use uh, Fattoria Fresca tomatoes. You know, it's the one with the big Jersey Fresh on the label. Oh, yeah. And it's it's essentially, if I did some research, Sclafani, which you can get here on the East Coast. I don't know uh, how available it is elsewhere. Uh, so that's the same stuff, the same company that makes Sclafani. Oh, interesting. Uh, uh -huh. Who is it? B and G Foods distributes Sclafani and. Uh, uh -huh. Are they using Jersey? Do they use Jersey yeah. tomatoes in theirs as well? Yeah, it's you know it's almost like DOP for Jersey. So like the yeah, Jersey right. Fresh symbol right. is for any product that's grown in Jersey. You get that symbol from the uh, Jersey Department of Agriculture, and you can put it on your labels. It's just like with Fattoria Fresca tomatoes, they put it on there really big. So you almost think that's the brand name. I think uh, uh, Joe. I, mean, like, I like. <coughs> Pardon me. I think Joe Badia does uses the same. He likes. Yeah. He uses those Jersey tomatoes at, well, at I mean, Pizzeria Badia. Yeah, I started using it because I was doing my pop up out of uh, Emily in Brooklyn, uh -huh. on Matt Island. Uh, he's also one who uh, kind of popularized Detroit inspired pizza here in New York right. City uh, at Emmy Squared, but he was using the Jersey fresh stuff. And then when I was doing the pop up there, of course I just like, oh, this works perfectly. And then when I did research, I was like, oh, okay, it's Sclafani, which I use using at home. So of course. 
So uh, you just put a, a rim of cheese around the, the perimeter. What kind of cheese is that? That is cheddar. It's white cheddar. cheddar. It's interesting. Yes. A lot of the, uh, the the folks who are doing the square pies are used like to use cheddar around the edge as well for their frico. Yeah, the, I found, I mean, like I said, I started doing this process like 2014. I used all sorts of different cheeses on the edge for a f couple months, I tried. But it quickly became apparent that white cheddar was the best because when it, um, you know, it browns. It might get a dark golden brown, but it does not get that black color. Yeah, and a lot yeah. Of people like a black, like mozzarella color on the edges. Yeah. And they say, you know, it doesn't taste burned. It's not really burned. I think it, visually, it doesn't look good to me. It looks yeah. good. So I like that nice dark golden color. Well, I, I like the cheddar for because it tastes so darn good. I think it's oh, that's it's, good. it's so uh, underappreciated by most uh, by most people. I think in general, but uh, yeah. certainly in the Italian pizza community, it's it tends to be you know frowned upon because it's not an Italian cheese. But exactly. it, to me, it's just like one of the great cheeses of the world. We take yeah. it for granted. And of course, Brian, you've got your Tillamook out in the West Coast doing their version of, uh, of cheddar too. So we've all got, yeah, the, the, the cheddar is really, I think of it really as, a, as an American cheese, although it's probably really English in origin, but it's really, it's kind of like our home court cheese, I think. Yeah. It was weird. Like last week they called me up and they said, uh, I've got a 40 pound block of white aged cheddar for you. Come pick it up. I'm like, why? Nice. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to ask twice, but yeah, I got a 40 pound block in my refrigerator right now. It's fantastic. It's fantastic. Best. Great. Oh, oh, now you're putting more cheese on. What kind of cheese are you putting on now? So this is uh, something I call Koo Blend. My last Kuban. name is Kuban. <laughs> the Kuban Blend, yeah. Yeah. Kuban Blend is just mozzarella, cheddar, and fontina. Um, there you go. Great combo. Two, two to one to one, uh, mozzarella being the two. Two and one and one. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I switch it up. I'm not trying to be spoily. Yeah. I switch it up here and there. I've never hit upon something I really like. Or you could probably, I, like. I suppose, experimenting. I suppose so, uh, provolone uh, would also work. Maybe even Gouda and some other cheese. Um, I've used Favardi at times. Uh huh. And so basically, it's a cheese blend. So now you've got a three cheese pizza because you've got your cheddar, your, your, uh, mozzarella and your fontina. Yeah, it's actually, um, I don't know if you saw, I put a, sprinkled a little Romano on there too. Oh, so, so fortunate that, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, like I said, I grew up, my dad was uh, always chasing a shaky style type pizza. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna throw this in the oven now. And all right, like beautiful. So, so I'm just throwing it in a home oven. I'm not gonna show you all that stuff. So well, about what, what, what temperature, Adam? It's at 550, and I'm going to set it for eight minutes on the timer. Okay, fantastic. Wow. So, uh, again, uh, a great technique, especially for, uh, for, uh, for home cooks. I, I think it's a great technique because you, you can use a cake pan. Uh, most people, even if, you, even if you don't have a 12-inch cake pan, you could do a 10-inch or a 9-inch or an 8-inch yeah. cake pan version of this. And, and with uh, some great technique tips with the, with the shortening used to kind of keep that dough from – from from uh, springing back too far in, it holds it right up to the edge, and then yeah. and then and then a rim of, of cheddar for the for that crispy cheese frico, and then uh, whatever whatever else you want on top, right? Yeah. Well, I picked up the uh, the shortening trick from uh, Zane Hunt at Via Three One Three in Austin. In, uh, Austin. Via yeah. Three One Three, of course, is uh, Detroit style. Three One Three being uh, the area code of Detroit. Right. Uh, he taught. I really talked to Zane a lot when I was uh, first doing the pop up and like considering doing a permanent location. And he schooled me on like you know on on ours we use a little bit of shortening around the edge to watch to keep that snap back from happening. So, well, thank you, Zane. I've had I've had his pizza at uh, at three one three and it's great, fabulous. Yeah, it's fantastic. Uh, square, you know, Detroit style. And, yeah, yeah. His brother Brandon, they're fantastic guys. Wow. Well, so. well, why don't we do this? The pizza's in the oven. We're, when we come back, we'll, we'll take a little break. We'll come back for our final segment, and we'll have John show us his version. But we'll start by looking at yours when it comes out of the oven. Sound like a plan? Yeah. All right, yeah. folks, join us for the next segment of Pizza Talk. We're going to go into 
uh, our third version of the pan style pizza. Adam, thank you so much for sharing that technique. Uh, everyone, keep your eyes out for uh, for Margot's pizza because uh, at some point that pop up is going to start popping again. And uh, and thank you for for uh, you know sort of taking on uh, this uh, in in your own way, taking on bringing back this style because it's the it's 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 the it's almost like the popcorn effect. We're seeing individuals kind of all of a sudden simultaneously like the zeitgeist is struck, and it's a time a moment is time time has come, and it's only a matter of time before it starts popping like crazy we'll yeah. see you on the next segment of pizza talk uh with the big reveal of adam's pizza and then we'll, we'll see john arena's version as he's going to eventually introduce it at metro see you soon all right welcome yeah. back for for uh, the final round of our bar parlor uh, tavern style pizza uh, uh, extravaganza, Adam in the last segment has uh, put his pizza in the oven. It's out now, but it's not finished. So Adam, tell us which, how you're going to finish it up before we send it over to John for his version. Yeah, so I threw this in the oven, which is in the home oven um, at 550, baked about eight minutes. Now it's just to the point where it's set, like I can transfer it. And I like uh, a lot of the East Coast bar pizzas I've seen, you pull it from the pan and then you just flash it on the hearth of the oven. So I'm going to do that here. And in your case, your hearth is, you're actually going to use a pizza steel, right? For your hearth? Yeah, I've got a, got a bacon steel going in there. For Great, this, we, it might be a little bit of overkill because uh, you got to watch it really closely that it doesn't burn. Right. See, it's so, so, pretty floppy as pretty is. Fl yeah, yeah. Oversized cookie spatula to get it out, but now I'm just gonna launch it onto the baking steel. Really onto quick. the steel, into it. And so steel instead of a stone, but you could use a baking stone if you have that. We had uh, Andres Logston on Pizza Talk a while back, and and he yeah. kind of uh, you know gave us the ins and outs of the of the baking steel, which which yeah. we love because it's such a cool tool. And so so you got it in for maybe only a minute. And the minute's going to be minute in the, so. that minute or two. We'll give it the the, the crisp and the and the snap that we're looking for, right? The crisp, the color, like the texture. Yep. So I'm gonna go check it. Well, let's hang with you on this until we get it out because you're so close, and we want to see the the, the finished version. Um, and so, uh, and Adam is of course uh, was doing the the pop ups of Margos uh, at a couple of different places. And uh, as it continues to fine tune his method, you were just telling me that you've been places where you had a wood fired. You had to do the whole thing in a wood fired oven. And how did yeah, you deal so, with that? Uh, yeah, originally at Emily in Brooklyn, uh, we they have a wood fired oven, and that was the space I had available to me. I was like, I'm going to make this work. So we tried cooking it entirely in the wood fired oven first in the pan, and then flashing it. But it's a real pain in the ass to uh, do it on the pan, in the pan because they yeah. take up a lot more room than, say, just yeah. like a regular Neapolitan or Neo-Neapolitan style wood. Yeah. Uh, so we ended up hitting upon just using the regular uh, commercial kitchen oven, and we'd throw, it, throw those in right on the rack and uh, cook them for about eight minutes, and then pull them, just like you saw. And then finish them up then, in the wood fire. Yep, and finish them in the wood fire. Look at and that. We do, right. pretty low, we do a pretty low um, flame on the wood fired oven, if any flame at all. Right, we we're not talking about, about 600. It. Yeah, it's not, this is not and your 900 degree uh, Neapolitan. Yeah, no. But it, there it, it is. Look at it. Primarily. And, and you can even see from this angle that, that incredible frico around the edge from the cheddar cheese that you put uh, around the rim of the pan. And uh, what what are you just uh, just adding a little salt and pepper there? Or what? Yeah, I finished with pepper and let me grab it if I've got it. Yeah, looks good. You you had mentioned that you uh, use uh, even a little Romano in the in the cheese blend. Do you? Uh, oh, okay. you, don't, you don't need um, was a was a Romano it could be Parmesan. It could be some kind of dried cheese, right? Yeah, it, it really depends for me. Um, here, I just use Romano. I don't use the Romano in the cheese blend though. Um, oh, you I do it as a separate. It That's right. You just do it as a sprinkle. Yeah. I sauce it, cheddar the rim, and then sprinkle Romano, and then I hit it with the Kublen, 
And then a little bit of olive oil and into the oven it goes. And there it is. And, and now it's ready to eat. And you cut it in squares or you cut it in wedges? No, I cut it into wedges. wedges. I know uh, right. this is the thing. I'm, I'm kind of superstitious about this. I know somebody, uh, is it Nate Appleman? Was oh, that yeah. It? Yeah, I know Nate. He opened a place, Polino's, and he, he's from Milwaukee, and he's used to the tavern cut. So yeah. he cut it into squares, and the New York food press <laughs> like, what is that? I, uh, I was there. I went to Paulina's when he first opened, and it was like, I yeah. That, <laughs> and I said, well, I am not going to cut my pizza into tavern cut. What about you, Brian? Do you do uh, wedges or, or squares? I like triangles, man. I just can't get into the. I'm from the Midwest. I'm from Detroit. Uh, and I just can't get into that uh, party cut. It just doesn't make sense for me. So you, so you cut them like like Adam does it. You're going to be serving it. Uh, yeah. So my, I cut my slices. 12, if it's larger than twelve inches, it's getting cut into twelve triangles, right? It's about like. Oh wow! I like triangles. It's, so, oh, uh, so, uh, so you know, so you're not actually cutting slices like you do. You, how do you do a triangle? What do you when you say triangle? What do you mean? Well, you know, it's a classic pizza cut. Right. Oh, yeah, classic. Like, okay. So now you're just putting some fresh basil. Looks like uh, a little, a little uh, tribute to Defaro's there. This cutting, is, yes. Cutting, yeah. cutting the, the herb uh, right with the scissors at the moment of service. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and if I had it, well, you right know what there. I might do. I'm Demarco. Comes back. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, for even more Defara, got my little. Right. Uh, uh, this is a 24 month aged farm. Uh, now we got Romano and Parm in there. All right. So now we got some garnishing happening and the flavors start to pop, the visuals pop, and then you've got that snap in the, in the crust. And there is Adam Kuban's beautiful, beautiful wow, really nice under crust. Um, look at that. And close up, see how thin that is. Even with the rolling pin, without the sheet, you're able to keep it thin. And how about the edge? Do you see any? Your your stays pretty flat around the edge. It doesn't really puff much, right? No, it doesn't. Yeah. But the cheese fills in and gives it the it gives it sort of that little border area. And yeah. and uh, and so we've got our frico. We got all the elements of a of a of a classic, beautiful, in a Burger. sense, updated bar pizza. Beautiful. So then, with that also, Adam, thank you so much for doing that for us and showing us your method. This pizza, your pizza, is going to be featured as one of many pizzas in the new Pizza Quest book that will be coming out next year. Uh, and we'll be doing 35 tribute pizzas to uh, the various from the various guests that we've had on Pizza Talk. Uh, we'll have Brian's pizzas in there, we'll have John Arena's pizzas in there, and many others. So, uh, so uh, those who are watching, keep an eye out for that. And you will. We'll, recapitulate some of these techniques that uh, Adam has shown us today. But uh, let me see, I think we've lost John. Did we lose John Arena? He's going to show us his method. What is that? Oh, there's your little bubbling? Yeah, Mr. Bub. Yes, that's, I can get those. That I'm bub. so happy. <laughs> well, and, that's why I do the whole lamination thing. Yeah. What I remember from, from my childhood when, when, when you get those bubs is that the bubs would actually char. And they would Man. start to they break and and I, and when I would when I would go with my dad and brothers and all to our pizza parlor, well, I would always be the one that would grab the, the slices with the biggest bubbles, you know. Yeah, yeah. You know. All right, John. I, you're. I, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was just gonna say I toured Domino's HQ once. They yeah. let us make a pizza, and I'm not gonna get in anything or denigrate anybody, but they put the pizza through the impinger and bubbles were forming like that and they have a special tool of course to open the oh. side and, yeah. and i was like oh don't don't right, right. Uh, so That's when mine went through and the bubbles came i was like do not pop them let, let them go them. let them go yeah well i know that I, I understand why they would do that because you know nine out of ten people will love it but then there'll be that one person who just freaks out and they say you burned my pizza you know right. so so i get it but John, we're we're gonna we're gonna switch over to you now in Vegas, and you're gonna show us, uh, you know, your sort of I'm gonna call it the consolidation of everything that that we've been talking about into the uh, into the metro version of a bar pizza. Right, which my version is always a consolidation of my memories, whatever I can steal from Brian Spangler, <laughs> uh, 
and, and also an application of, of our production concerns because we're feeding 18,000 people a week. Yeah. So, you know, wow. there, are methods that, there are methods that may not work for, yeah. for, for me that work for other people. And, when, you know, if, if I were making every pizza, there might be a certain way that I would do it that would be a little bit different than what, than what I have to do of commercially. Course. Of course. So, so what I do is I try to think about how do I hack this? What's my end goal and how do I get there? So without, in our conversation with Brian, we talked about that beautiful lamination. We, and, and he had, you know, he had a, a method of getting to it that you, know, you could see the results. It looks amazing. But I was, I was thinking, okay, how do I get that lamination? And then during our discussions, we talked about PETA. And it occurred to me that basically what we, what we could do is create a PETA, flash bake it, so that it puffs up, and then let it cool completely down before we compress it. Ah. And, we have, and we would have that separation. Which is interesting. Up. So you do a blind okay. bake, basically, or just the, just the dough itself. Okay. Right. right. So my dough was about 52% hydration, 5% lard. Um, because there's a little, a little lower hydration, I lower my salt. I'm usually at about 2.5. I went to two. Okay. And I know that those, that those old doughs that we remember usually had sugar in them. And I'm usually not an advocate of sugar, but the sugar was there. So I went 1% sugar. Okay. What, just I 1%, do, just a little I bit do, of sugar. And I do, normally I do 0.5 yeast. I went to 0.6. So a yeah. little bit more of the yeast like Brian right. did. Uh, right. Let me just ask Adam a real quick question. Uh, Adam, you, what, you, what kind of fat did you use in your dough? Did you use shortening in your dough? I use shortening this time. I, um, I play around with it, but yeah, this I use shortening and give me really nice. Here. It's very supple, actually. Yeah. Okay. So, so most of you, the the choice is usually some kind of a hard fat, a shortening, uh, whether it's lard or or Crisco, or of course, as Brian pointed out, Crisco is a totally different formula than the Crisco that we grew up with, which was uh, much more hydrogenate, hydrogenated. Now it's less hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated, so it doesn't have the same it's not function. Hydrogenated at all anymore? It's more of a, and so it's softer. But it's, but you know, uh, there's trade-offs and everything. But if you want to stick with the with the the, the solid fat, then uh, lard is probably your best choice. Leaf but, lard. Uh, and leaf leaf lard in particular, which leaf is like the highest is. quality of all. Uh, and and so you use lard in yours as well, John, right? I do, because okay. I like lard. But if I, when I'm doing this, when we, when we introduce, I would this, probably use bacon fat. <laughs> when I introduce this into the pizzeria, naturally I can't use lard because that cuts out a lot of people that don't eat pork products. Oh well, right. So back to shortening for that, but you know, for us, well, for today, fat. yeah, for for our for our, our our benchmark versions. Right. Okay. So, so 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 you got your your you've done a pre bake basically. You created a, a right. pizza effect with separation, and then you and then you turned it into a pizza. Uh, Adam, you, I know that you've got um, uh, some appointments and you may have to uh, drop out at some point before we finish, but uh, just in case, um, is there anything that we didn't get to cover with you uh, that you wanted to tell us about, about your method? I could talk about this for like hours, but... Um, no, I'm I know one thing we didn't get to do was you got to take a bite while we were talking to John, uh, and, and what was that bite like? Oh, it's fantastic. It was, uh, no, I mean... Normally, I'm usually disappointed with my pizza uh, because I think any pizza maker will tell you there's always room to improve. But um, this one I was happy with. I mean, I obviously could see places where I could have improved on it, uh -huh. uh, but I was happy with the amount of sauce, the amount of cheese. Uh, the cheese was crisp. I mean, there were crispy parts of the cheese, um, but there was some nice cheese pull. You know, the, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. the blend. Uh, the fontina really helps with that stringiness. Yeah. Uh, but then one thing I was really, uh, really inspired by a colony grill is I love, if you look at it, it's uh, pockmarked and that's because of the cheddar. So the cheddar, when it gets hot, the oils break from the cheddar and they bubble up through it and create this little pockmarked thing going on. The problem that, with that is if you get too much cheddar in the mix, then you get all pockmarking and it's plasticky. I think that's what the, the, the technique that Justin DeLeon does at uh, Apollonia's, uh, Apollonia's Pizzeria in L.A. 
where he's become famous on Instagram for his his crown his crown pizza, which is that frico that kind of rises way above, and yeah, it's totally pockmark. It's kind of like uh, like a uh, like one of those cookies that uh, you know that's all uh, what are they called these the uh, the flaky cookies? Oh, but it, yeah, I want to say a Florentine, yeah, but you want to know how you Florentine? Think. I think it is, yeah. Uh, but anyway, so so uh, uh, part of that texture, I see John is back. So you got the effect you were looking for by doing the the double bake. You 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 bake it first in the pan, finish it off uh, on a on a hearth on a stone or a, or a steel, and then you get the, the that great caramelization on the under underskirt of the pizza as well as uh, the crispness around the, the frico edge. Yes, right. That, you know that's my idea. Um, let me just adjust my camera. All right, we're back with you. Yeah, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm also, of course, I'm thinking about how do I turn these out in in bulk? You know, how do I make a lot of them and make it as easy on my pizza line as? You know, there's only so much Chris Decker can do. <laughs> Chris, Chris, of course, is is your right hand man uh, as well as uh, you know uh, a star in his own right in the pizza world. He is like. Uh, what uh, entrees will be with for uh, for Brian when when you turn him loose in the in the at the next pizza expo and let him start competing against some of the big guys He's, he, we're, we can't wait to see what what uh, you know how he rises in his own right but everybody needs an Andres or a Chris or uh, you know anyone in the pizza world all always starts bringing a team together that uh, allows you to continue to be creative and not and not have it all be on your shoulders. Well, you know, also the leader uh, being creative that inspires the people behind you, right? So, yeah, you have to lead the way and keep keep them inspired to keep them motivated to continue to do what they do. You know, like, right? They they, yeah. they 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 feed off that. So when I'm like doing this shit, you know, yeah, Andres is like, what are we doing? Yeah, right. right. And then he eats it. And he's like, "Oh, it's really uh, he's just added something new to his repertoire as a result." Yeah, like and the then, like the calzones. He's well, like, I think I don't really like calzones, and like we'll try this one. He's like, this is good, <laughs> exactly. And I think that uh, for both of you, uh, you know, one of the greatest joys you'll have in life is is when your proteges surpass you and are doing things that even you didn't think of. Oh yeah, I, I I know he's gonna totally beat me up. <laughs> <laughs> well, John, we're back to you now. You've got okay. your pizza. Let's go ahead and put your pizza together. Okay, so I'm gonna roll that dough out so it looks like this. Uh huh. All right, you can see it's very thin, about a quarter of an inch. Uh huh. Okay. Then I'm gonna pop it in the oven. So you're par baking. I've seen uh, um, some uh, Sardinian style pizzas where, which is done like this, where the, where you create that uh, you know that that pita effect, and you've actually bake a pita, essentially a type of pita bread, and then turn it into a pizza. Yeah. And even uh, Mario Batali, back when he was first opening Otto in New York, his original concept was was to make them on a griddle, and and then finish them under the broiler by having them you know pop up and puff. Uh, and, that, and he was tribu uh, attributing that to the Sardinian sort of method of that. Right. Uh, Sardinian, of that, uh, yeah, the cart, parchment uh, paper dough. Yeah, the parchment dough. Yeah, and so uh, so in a way, you're kind of uh, playing off of that, which is which is kind of neat. Because I was wondering if anybody would start to do that in you know in their operations, is create a a a, a pita type pizza. So so you're it's in there for a minute or two, and it's going to puff, and then you're going to end up getting. Uh, a finished pita, which is what is that what you have in front of you now is one that's already gone through this process? Right, right. that's what this is. Okay. As and you can see, it's separated. I yeah. let it cool down. I'm, I let it cool down before I pressed it down because I didn't want, if you don't let it cool down, they just combine again because they're still. Right. right. Still going. I let, yeah. I let yeah. It wait. Okay. So he's going to pull that one out and show us. So the camera's not catching it, but we'll catch it when it comes to the bench. There we go. Oh, there we go. Got a pita bread, basically. Puff, big, full of air, full of hot, steamy air that if you were to break it and puff it right now, you'd get a steam burn. 
So he's going to let that kind of gradually uh, dissipate, and uh, when it falls, and that will finish off also the the uh, uh, gelatinization of the starches, so it doesn't stick right. back together again later. Right. So yeah. Another way of getting layers. Exactly. It's, it's, I love the idea that, uh, that there's three different ways that we've just explored, and there are probably dozens of different ways to get to kind of a great finished pizza, but these are three that we've looked at today that are just, you know, fresh uh, approaches to each style. Right. And, you know, I think you always have to, you have to adapt to, your, to the tools that you have at hand. You know, like, like Adam said, you had to adapt to the, to the wood-burning oven. Right. You, should be, you know, you should be able to, if you're a professional, if you're serious about your craft, you adapt to what's there and you adapt to what the conditions are. Right. And that's why some of these guys that are, that are cooking on, on food trucks right now are doing pop-ups. They're going to end up being amazing pizza makers. Right. That's all, those, those places are all about adaptation. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. Trial by fire, literally. Well, and, and in this case, you can, you can make these uh, pre-baked uh, pita puffs, so to speak. Uh, way, you can line them up and have them done way ahead before you even open. And then exactly. you can, uh, and then just keep up with the demand when the orders come in. Yep. All right. So, so how would okay. you assemble it then? So, so here's my sauce, which kind of like Brian's, so the much thicker. Much like, much like Brian, uh -huh. I start with super dolce as a break, as a base. Yep. And then I go with the eleven herbs and spices, like kernel, like the kernel. Yeah. There's um, olive oil, thyme, oregano, salt, black pepper, white pepper. And granulated garlic, uh -huh. which I don't use granulated garlic for, for many things. But this pizza, if you think about what those sauces tasted like, and yeah. you know, back in the day, in those types of pizzerias, yeah. or those types of taverns, there was always some granulated garlic thrown in there by the handful. I like and it. I like, I like I like what it does to a, to a sauce too. And the nice thing is, it's that uh, you can use fresh garlic. But some people say, "Well, I only use fresh garlic," but the granulated garlic has a whole different effect. It does, and you also. You want to, for this type of pizza, you want to use a thicker sauce. Um, the pizza is thin to begin with. So what happens is if the, when the pizza is that thin and there's, and there's a thin sauce, the sauce can really break down and get uh -huh. kind of soupy. And also, characteristic of these pizzas when I was growing up, especially if you went to a Shakey's or, or, or a round table, you noticed that the cheese was really white. And it was not only because there was a lot of cheese on it, but also because that sauce was thick and the cheese didn't break down as much. I see. So you'll see that we're going to get it. You know, so again, you know, the theme, the theme of everything that, that we've done over the, over the last several months, Peter, is Brian and I, get, we're aiming for the same thing, but we just, you know, we get there by a different route. Right. I love it. And, 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 and that's because you're each bringing a lifetime of experience, uh, of different experiences, you know, to, to the target. And, uh, and then we get to be the beneficiaries of that because we can, we can cherry pick the various uh, concepts and ideas that you've come up with. So that really spreads and it, like, like uh, Brian was spreading his with like a, like an icing spatula practically. And you're, and you're using just the back of a spoon. It looks like. Yeah. Uh-huh. There we go. Okay. Now that I'm going to use, um, I'm going to put some Romano, on the cheese, I mean, on the on the sauce. Well, there, there's Adam's trick right there, Romana. I'm gonna crush a little a little oregano on my fingertips. A little chili flake. Uh, I'm not using chili. I you use just, you, because you I did, you my, did my use you did use some fresh you did use some uh, some oregano. Did you say? Did you put that on? Yeah, I used some okay. fresh some some dry oregano, which I like to. Uh -huh. I like to always crush that in my fingertips as and I that's, fry. Is that before the cheese you put that on? I did. I'm actually going to put it on again. Okay, double double it up. Okay. Right. One, and then you no, one, is, one is for the flavor of the sauce, and the other is for the, the fragrance of the pizza when it comes out of the oven. Got it. So I put it on top of the cheese as well. So what kind of cheese are you using now? I'm using straight whole milk mozzarella. Total mozz. I like the fact that it's, you know, that you're, well, of course, I think most pizzerias do it was the whole milk as opposed to the low fat, which is too rubbery. Yeah, fat tastes good. Fat tastes good, exactly, yeah. Like the part skin, is that what you're talking about? Yeah, the part skin, which I think I is, you know, I don't really understand why anybody uses that. No, no, what, I mean, you can't, the two can't compare. The only, I think people switched it because they didn't want the, 
the oil puddling and pooling at the top. But because you know, you're baking it too long. Well, because it separates out. Yeah. Right. Or your or your oven's not the oven's the oven heat's not balanced, and you get too much top heat. Yeah. Breaking uh -huh. down. I yeah. think you know, that's releasing the oil. Right. Whole milk all day long. It's funny people people will buy this beautiful cheese from Wisconsin with with amazing butterfat content. Yeah. And they blend it with they blend it with a with a part skim cheese. Yeah. To knock it down to where a, a mediocre cheese would be anyway. Right. Oh, well, let's remember it's always about flavor. Flavor rules. So uh, that's a know, flavor you, rule. Yeah, it's a flavor rule, and you can you know you can you can uh, uh, make trade offs you know by by lowering the fat or this or that. But uh, in the end, you got to really ask yourself, what is it? The, what is it that's going to bring you back time and time again for that slice? Okay, so now I'm going to I'm going to top this with sausage, but I'm going to what I'm using is what I, what I call cup and char sausage, the way oh. the cup and char pepperoni has been so yeah. big. Yeah. So what I do is I, I boil the sausage, and then I and then I let it cool completely down. I chill it, and then I slice it real thin, and then I roast it in the oven. So the I don't know if you can see this, but so this has already been pre-cooked and pre-slightly charred already. Right. That's with the casing? With the casing. Good. Interesting. So you boil yeah, it. Just, um, like pepperoni, just like the pepperoni has casing on it. Right. It's good. So you, but you boil it first, which is, interesting. does that have to get rid of some of the fat? Because I don't want to have to roast it for too long. Oh, I see. So it's already, it kind of sets it gonna, and firms it up. It's going to yeah. get roasted again in the oven now. Okay, and now I'm going to use, I'm going to add some roasted red peppers, which are just seasoned with olive oil, garlic, parsley, and salt. What kind of peppers are those? They're just red peppers, just red, sweet red peppers. Bell peppers. Yeah. You know, we've been talking so much about shakies. I'm the guy in the room that's qualified to imitate shakies because my hands are shaking already. <laughs> Yeah, but you know, we've been making, you've been making pizzas for a long, long time, John. Okay, so here it goes. All right. This might be my last one right here. <laughs> That's an, uh, the you ultimate bar pizza now. But this is at a whole different technique. So this is the on a on a pre-baked pita-like pizza dough. And um, how long do you think it will take to bake? It's gonna take about five minutes. So you don't have to worry about baking the crust. It's already baked. It's just going to right. uh, brown up, but it's just melting right. the cheese now. And you don't want right. the cheese to get golden brown. You want it to be kind of a more on the on the uh, whitish side, the ivory side. Exactly. But um, I'm not afraid to let it really cook. You know, to me, right. the contrast between between lightly cooked and medium cooked and and burnt, dark, <laughs> caramelized, I like that. Uh huh. You know, to me. Uh, Culinary fascism is the is the the enemy, right? It's like this idea of everything having to be exactly uniform and look like a cookie cutter. It doesn't bother me if the pizza has got, you know, like like Adam was talking about popping those bubbles. What are you making, Wonder Bread? Yeah, right. You know, you know when right. he, when they, when he went to Domino's and they popped the bubbles. We want those bubbles there. The bubbles taste good. Fat tastes good. Contrast want, tastes I good. Want, Contrast. I want all my I think, breads, I want all of my pizzas to go from GBD to black. GBD? GBD is what? Golden brown delicious. A oh, golden brown delicious. I see. And, you, and, you, and you're pushing it all the way to black. So, you well, know, you, I, you I always have, say like, that. You want to have all, the, you know, if you're doing it right, your, your, you know, your fermentation level is right and your baking process is right. You're going to have anything that goes from like a light GBD, golden brown delicious, to like mahogany to black. It's, yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a combination of everything in between. And that's, uh, you know, my, my, my biggest problem when I started off 20 years ago was everybody said everything that I did was burnt. And I'm like, no, it's not burnt. Does it taste burnt? Does it taste acrid? No. Yeah. Okay. So. But that's because you. That's because you started out as a bread baker trying to do the bien cuit uh, loaves, where you really want to push the, the in the European model, push for caramelization and not the American style of sort of you know light, not not even golden brown delicious, but light brown delicious. You know, not even delicious. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, Chad 
Robertson and uh, Craig Ponsford and even yourself. And then uh, I worked with uh, one of your good friends, Tim. Tim Decker. Decker. Yeah. I worked yeah. with Tim Decker for two months. And uh, yeah, it really changed my perspective on where it was. On, you know, right. Right. If you think of what those, those breads were like at Sullivan Street Bakery, that's another yeah. example. They were yeah, really, exactly. Really, pushing you know, for flavor, always pushing for flavor. Steve Sullivan, what? No, no uh, Sullivan Street, New York. Oh, uh, uh, that that was uh, uh, Jim Jim Lay. Oh, Jim Lay. I yeah. have not, I've yet to meet him. Um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He's 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 brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I'm, so I'm one, so, one degree of separation away from that guy. It's when you next your next trip to New York, we'll get you together with him. Yeah. So so John, uh, you've got one in the oven. Uh, um, meanwhile, Adam is, uh, you've been making more pizzas as we've been talking, right? You've been, you've been rolling some out, it looks like. But, I mean, I'm still good to stay here, but like after this, I have to go pick up my daughter from school and I know. she knows I'm doing this. So, yeah. but we, but I, did, did I see you in the background making it, making another pizza while we were talking? Making a pepperoni pizza for pepperoni her. Pepperoni pizza. Oh, for, her. oh, for, for, and, and your daughter is Margo, right? Margo. Your daughter is Margo. That's, oh, of course, yeah. Margo's pizza. Yeah. Yeah. So what you saw earlier was a margarita. That's why I got hit with the uh, base. Uh, a margarita. Love it. Love it. Well, I think John's pizza is about ready to come out. I don't be on the second, but you know, talking about caramelization, this is a this is a pizza that Chris Decker made earlier. Wow. And, and I golden brown delicious combined with some burnt. It's exactly yeah, what Brian was talking about. Perfect. And it was made on one of these these uh, pre baked. Pita type crust? No, this one this was made on our regular dough. A regular we're dough. Okay. For the same, we're shooting for the same aesthetic and the same philosophy. I see, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you you, you know, don't don't sacrifice one element for the whole. Yeah. But you know, like ain't like, you know, you have you have an end game, but like sometimes like when I tell my employees like, yeah, that should have been in the, the oven a little you know, another thirty seconds. Because it would have like Right, it would have improved right. the whole product. Yeah, and the, then they're pointing at like then then they're like, yeah, but the crust because they, they then they start focusing on the crust and how the colorization is. I'm like, look at the cheese; it's starting to dry out. Don't sacrifice the whole for one element. You have to like, right? Um, we're thinking about the whole balance of all of this. And right. uh, every day is not the same. Right. right? My staff jokes that I can I could be easily replaced by a recording that says, put the pizza back in the oven. <laughs> exactly. All right, so John, the pizza is now out of the oven. Sorry we got interrupted with, with, in the Zoom, but we're, we're back. Now the pizza's on. Now look at that. That you we were talking about the the contrast of color pushing that crust and get that edge like golden brown and we've seen everything the cheese is still on the lighter side which is what you were shooting for but your sausage is now as is, is, is caramelized because you pre-cooked it and then we got Brian with his slice and he's doing uh, yeah he's, he's got the, that big he's got the separation going in his you got your separation by pre-baking the crust Brian got it by doing lamination and then Adam is back with us, and he's got uh, his version, which was baked in a pan to get to really get that amazing uh, edge, the the, the Frico edge. Uh, amazing three different techniques uh, for getting to a quote bar, tavern, a parlor pizza, thin crust, lots of cheese, lots of flavor, lots of snap, all the check boxes going in. Yeah. And and that's why we're we're sort of predicting here that this style is could be the next big thing. Everyone always wants to know what's good. next. My when when, thing, when are we gonna run out of things? Now we got you know probably uh, uh, I'm gonna guess that in a couple of years Brian will have a a chain of pizza parlors out there. Never. <laughs> what about now? The, now one thing I ask one final question before we call it a day, and that is. Doesn't this style, since it, 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 it like the way that Adam, you know, re re Christ his on the on the stone and the steel and uh, uh, you know 
the thinness of the crust, wouldn't this style lend itself to a frozen version, a frozen pizza? Uh, could it work as a frozen product? I've already tested it. And? It works. Yeah. So, so, works so, great. so this could be an, an opportunity in the frozen sector for a whole new category of, I of just uh, talked, bar I stuff. I talked to Craig Ponsford the other day about and Craig is a famous artisan baker that um, all of us know. And, and what did he say? He's just totally down. He thinks it's a great idea. <laughs> and of course, Craig, Craig's version would be 100% whole wheat. He's got all the contacts, right? Like, this is the thing. He's got the contacts. I don't have the contacts. Right. Right. Yeah, well, well I, I imagine it, we'll it, be seeing this. It's really well, right? You, you, if you can get a production run on this stuff, and it's just like a... Like, yeah. Well, this, the thing you is, know, all the grocery stores, uh, the high-end grocery stores, like put them in. You know, like what uh, Roberta started, and now you have even uh, we've got uh, Bianca doing it sure. through Gold Been Belly. They're all sending out frozen pizzas. So basically, what we're talking about here, as opposed to most frozen pizzas, are uh, dough that's maybe, maybe or maybe not baked, but the cheese, everything is unbaked, and it goes in for about 12 minutes. We're talking about baking the pizza, then flash freezing it, and then having people crisp it up in the oven. Right? Is that is that the style? Well, I think I think this style of pizza could work just on being completely frozen altogether. Unbaked as an unbaked pizza. And then make it all in one shot in the oven. So it could go either way. I mean, well, we're, you know, to be determined, right? Well, when it hits the sta it's the shelves, you'll know that you heard it first here on Pizza Talk. We are with the Pizza Yodis today, John Arena, Brian Spangler. We've added uh, Adam Kuban, our newest Yodi. Adam, thank you so much for joining us. By the way, thank you also for all the great writing you've done over the years. Uh, you were really a major force, I think, in, in helping sort of spur the literary fascination with pizza uh, and, you know, and the, and the passion that uh, people felt like they had a voice out there that was, that was saying uh, what they were thinking. And so I want to thank you for all of that work as well. Uh, we, 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 we talked with uh, uh, Ed Levine on one of our earlier shows and, and he shouted you out as well as being, you know, major force in all this. So thank you for that. Good luck with Margo's. Can't wait for you to get those pop-ups going again. Thank Margo for giving a, giving this a name, and uh, John, thank you so much for your new technique. Uh, I don't know when and if it'll show up at uh, you know as you work out the the uh, logistics for making a part of Metro Pizza. But uh, again, those of you when you're in the Las Vegas area, there are what five six are all five or six in your locations open during the pandemic, or are they uh, are they waiting for things to change? Everything's open except for the uh, the airport. Just at the airport. So, uh, yeah, uh, a number of locations of Metro Pizza uh, where you can get celebrate all these different styles. And then we've got uh, Andres and Brian at uh, Pizza Shoals in Portland, Oregon. Oh, Andres, thank you so much for uh, being part of this today. We're looking. We're we're, we're going to be tracking your career. We want uh, Brian is going to be going to be taking you to new heights uh, once we get once we can all get together again at. Uh, you know, whether it's at Vegas or if some of the various pizza shows, or, uh, we'll, we'll all get together in person when that happens. But in the meantime, uh, all of you keep coming back to Pizza Talk. Uh, we're keeping the, the conversation going uh, every week uh, with, with postings. Uh, the pizza luminaries uh, across the country and in the, across the world are joining us. And we will see you on the next episode of Pizza Talk. Again, thank you, Brian. Thank you, Adam. And thank you, John. See you all soon. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Brian, great to see you, buddy. Love Talk you. you man. Talk to you love soon. You, great love you all, guys. Love you all. Bye-bye. Pizza Quest is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. For our freshest content, subscribe to our newsletter, Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org, and connect with us on Instagram and Twitter at heritage underscore radio. You can also find us at facebook.com slash heritage radio network. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations 
to make the world a better, fairer, and more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without support from listeners like you. Want to be a part of the food world's most innovative community? Subscribe to the shows you like, tell your friends, and please join the HRN family by becoming a member. Thanks for listening.